it's a great pleasure, uh, I repeat, to be here and to, to, to speak uh, with all of you, unfortunately from Venice and not in, uh, in Melbourne. This is uh, the last image we commented on uh, Monday uh, when we were uh, talking with Francesco Dalco, and an image that uh, reminded us of um, a kind of unacceptable experience that uh, Venice received in this uh, 1989. After, during and after the concert of Pink Floyd uh, in, in Venice. And as Francesco told us, this was um, um, a clear sign of uh, an upcoming process of uh, the touristic uh, massification of the city placed in the center of the symbolic center of the city of the San Marco Square that brought this disrespect, disregard uh, of the city and of course brought, uh, as Francesco told us, also violence. No? And it was a moment that represented how certain political parties uh, were looking to the future of the city no? as a stage for these spectacular uh, performances. Starting from um, this absolutely the same uh, uh, place, so in front of San Marco, on the other side of uh, Canal Grande, um, uh, some a couple of years before, we witnessed uh, somehow a kind of opposite vision uh, of that one that we have seen before, a vision that Aldo Rossi, the great Italian architect, offered offered of uh, Venice through this uh, installation, Teatro del Mondo, sublime, I would say, uh, installation that was placed uh, for the Theater Biennale, 1980. Uh, parallel, I, rem I, 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 rem I remember to the famous Portoghese Biennale, no? the uh, Presenza del Passato, uh, the presence of the past. And it was a project that really led Aldo Rossi to uh, the international recognition, to the international fame, and, and that absolutely reflects this, his ability, his poetry, no? he, 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 that interpreted uh, through the tools, of course, of the archite architecture of the 1980s, the specific signs of, the, of, the, of a tradition of, of, of the specific place. No? We are talking about Venetian context and especially the interpretation of the temporary architecture of, uh, of uh, Venice. But um, we could also read this installation um, as a kind of, uh, yes, poetic, uh, uh, incredible interpretation of the city, but also somehow as an, a non, as unproblematic experience, you know? even as a kind of elitist vision of the city, where a poetical uh, architectural form can find its presence in the city only in a temporary mode. No, as an image that will somehow uh, remain only in photography. It was also realized, made to host a specific uh, short cultural function for a uh, few uh, users during the theater biennale. So a kind of uh, unshareable experience of contemporary architecture. Francesco, what do you think uh, about this? We, Francesco, unfortunately, your microphone is uh, off. Um, obviously, I agree, Luca, with your words about uh, Rossi's uh, Teatro del Mondo as an object and uh, its meaning, uh, which we could, uh, could talk later. It's interesting uh, to think that this uh, Teatro del Mondo, which uh, is a type of building which usually was built during the carnivals in the past. Uh, the Teatro del Mondo was an object, uh, let's say, better a stage on a boat, uh, moving through the different places in Venice in the past with the actors and performances, uh, uh, on it uh, represented for the entire city. At the end of the carnival, uh, it was usual to burn it. Uh, it was uh, just a ephemeral representation of a specific time in a year, the time of the carnival. At the end, uh, the real 
spectacle was uh, the destruction of the of the very same Teatro del Mondo. This is the reason also of the name, because it's a kind of representation of the passing time of the world. Uh, so uh, when uh, they took the decision to build, the Biennale took the decision to build the Teatro del Mondo was part of a larger, larger project in this time, to renovate uh, the tradition of the theater in uh, the city. The, the, the presence of the theater spectacles uh, all through the city. Not by chance is uh, the fact that is just from this moment that uh, the celebration of the carnival became again a great uh, touristic and uh, attract, important attraction for the life of Venice. It was also connected with the idea, uh, this was a very strong idea, that uh, uh, Venice is a kind of uh, gigantic uh, resort of uh, spaces uh, which had been abandoned. You mentioned, Luca, before, the exhibition that the Biennale and Portoghese did uh, in the Arsenal. Uh, the name was Strada Novissima, which was just 100 meters of a street, let's say, uh, built inside the Corderie, uh, the longer, longer space. Uh, it's 333 meters long is the space that where they use it they used to build the cord for the ship uh, in the past in the arsenal. Well, uh, Portuguese succeeded to get to open uh, 100 meter uh, of this uh, 333 meters to host uh, this exhibition. The exhibition was done uh, creating a certain number of facade. Uh, the selection of the architect was as all the selection of architects when you do the Biennale could be discussable or not discussable, but it was a great selection anyway. And uh, the event was extremely successful. And uh, the fact that for the first time, uh, in a cultural event, uh, an institution like the Biennale could put its feet uh, inside of uh, this larger area. The arsenal is uh, one fifth of the entire surface of Venice. So we should remember that. This created a, something which, uh, a process which never stopped which is the interconnection, the presence of the cultural institutions in, uh, and co connected with the life of the city, reopening of closed spaces as the arsenal was. The Teatro del Mundo was part of this process and uh, it, had, it, it, uh, it had also another characteristic that it was a kind related to the place where the Teatro del Mundo landed, let's say, if it's possible to use this word for the Teatro del Mundo, was a kind of epiphany, something which suddenly happened. And so it's the byproduct of a very interesting, very interesting contradiction the sudden presence of something which doesn't want to state its own presence as exceptional. The, the gift of, of Aldo, uh, of Aldo Rossi, and the gift of this event is represented by the contradiction between a sudden arrival of an object which doesn't want to exhibit itself as a surprising object, but as something which could be there from the beginning, which could be there always. And uh, the fact that the Teatro del Mondo was shaped like uh, uh, a toy for boys, like a little memory coming from, uh, from the memory of a little baby was uh, this perfect. And another thing which 
is not uh, is not very very often remembered. Is that uh, the Teatro del Mundo was in this shape just from the first day when Aldo did the first sketch, but afterwards uh, he did uh, thousands of sketches, always of the same shape. And it is a process uh, which produces the fact that uh, at the end, the proportion of the theater, which the theater doesn't have proportion, doesn't have a system of proportion, but uh, through this continuous work, I, uh, in this time, uh, we use it to see very, very often uh, in Venice, uh, and in Milano too with Aldo, and also during the lunch or the dinner, uh, Aldo was designing, designing continuously the Teatro del Mondo. The shape didn't change, but the dimension could change. Some, it was like, <clears throat> like a process, uh, an epiphany, let's say. It was an epiphany. And this created <clears throat> the, great, uh, the great success of this event. And probably uh, introduce a, a new way of uh, looking at the possibility to, to create in Venice something uh, which is able to understand the uh, difficulties to keep together the time, uh, the specific time of uh, a city, a town like Venice, by product of uh, an infinite number of liars uh, derived from a long, long time, and the little, little events that uh, can can uh, add just a little uh, drop of sand to this uh, to this uh, gigantic stratification. Well, it, what is important to Venice is, uh, to work in Venice is just always to remember that what you can do is something ephemeral or if you are very, if you are very lack, uh, just a drop of sand to a gigantic beach. Thank you for this marvelous metaphor. Uh, we um, jump. Uh, 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 to the Biennale of uh, of uh, 1991, where you were named as uh, the chief curator. I remember it was the fifth architectural Biennale, uh, and we are connecting uh, the, this comment and question to to the previous one. Uh, for this Biennale, you have proposed not one but a series of uh, occasions of reflections uh, on different scales and on different topics. Uh, you, uh, as far as I remember, you, your Biennale introduced the participation of the national pavilions on the, on, on, on the, the model of the Art Biennale. You proposed a series of competitions uh, where you invited uh, architects to reflect on Venice, uh, the entrance of Venice. I remember the, the, the competition for Piazzale Roma, the competition for um, the um, uh, Palazzo del Cinema Lido, the, for the renovation of the Italian Pavilion. So the reflection on uh, competition on the Biennale uh, uh, territories. And uh, what I would like to also to underline is, uh, uh, as you see in the, in the image, you propose the realization of the marvelous Jim Sterling Pavilion and the Massimo Scolari Alliant installation place in front of the exhibition of architectural schools. So the, the, regarding what you were saying before, so uh, uh, what, what were your objectives, were your ideas when you have been, uh, when you took that assignment, what you were, was your vision? And uh, also what were your point of reference in the moment when you took that cultural role? Well, the first thing was that uh, when I arrived to the Biennale, I succeeded uh, to obtain uh, the presence of, to do really an international exhibition of architecture, which means that the pavilions, the national pavilions were open. This is something that very often speaking of the Biennale is not very well clear to everybody. 
Uh, the Biennale is an institution, uh, the Italian government and state uh, pays uh, for it. The land where the Biennale is, is Venice, but uh, a gigantic amount of money uh, arrived for the exhibition from the national pavilions. Mm. And so if uh, uh, you don't have the presence uh, the, of uh, the national pavilions for the exhibition of architecture, you can do only something very small and which is, which is impossible to think uh, uh, as an international exhibition of architecture. This was the first step. The second step, and it is something that I am always, I am still convinced, is that uh, exhibition of architecture in any case, is an exhibition of something which is not born. You can put in an exhibition the most beautiful drawings by Michelangelo, the most beautiful drawings by Le Corbusier and so on, but they are drawings. Architecture is another thing. Architecture is built, is a shape, uh, materials uh, exhibited uh, in the sun, uh, in the, the rain, uh, in the night and in the day. Architecture is material. So when you do an exhibition of architecture, you are presenting a baby not yet born. And uh, this is important. And so I said, uh, well, architecture is not only something which is uh, subject to, to the light, uh, to the sun, and to the changing uh, seasons and so on, but this is also something which should give answers to real questions of the human beings. And for this reason, I decided to organize, to have this great opportunity, which is represented by the prestige that the Biennale has, to organize a real competition. And it was fantastic because all uh, the political, the political administration say, great idea, we should uh, solve the problem uh, of uh, uh, the arrival uh, uh, to Venice of millions of peoples uh, reshaping uh, an area which uh, was uh, shaped uh, during uh, the 30s. We should rebuild uh, the cinema palace if we wanted to compete with the other great uh, film festival in the world. And they said it's fantastic. And they said, and they did a lot, a lot of uh, pushing to have their representative in the juries and so on and so on. And afterwards, when the competition was, were, were concluded, they gave the job to the winner of the competition and immediately afterwards, they disappeared. This is the story, uh, what's happened. I had, uh, I had another problem in this time that uh, Luca knows it very well, nearby the entrance of uh, the Italian pavilion, uh, the main exhibition pavilion in the garden, there was, uh, in the past, uh, Carlo Scarpa built a little, uh, a little pavilion, which was uh, a bookshop, let's say. Uh, this pavilion was in wood, and uh, after a few years, uh, was destroyed by fire. When I was the director, there was some, somebody started to say, we should rebuild it. And I, thought, <clears throat> and I thought that could be a good idea. But as all the good ideas should be checked. And so I, I realized it immediately, it was very clear immediately, that there was no drawings by Scarpa. But uh, there are some very few sketches of the pavilion, but there is no drawing. As very often happens in, uh, with the work of Scarpa, you don't have drawings. And uh, I was absolutely convinced because I knew the story of this project and I know, I assume, uh, the work of Scarpa. I was absolutely convinced that it's, and I'm still convinced that it is impossible to build something by Scarpa without Scarpa. <laughs> And I did, and I say, no, no way. And I said, let's build a modern, a contemporary 
a contemporary bookshop. The Scarpa bookshop was very small, was something built by, by a very intelligent uh, uh, art dealer in Venice, very, very small. And uh, the Biennale in this time uh, was a place where thousands of people arrived. And so to have a very good, very large bookshop uh, was uh, something that, in my opinion, was needed. And it was also an occasion to do something uh, which is very important, uh, to enlarge uh, this alive museum of modern architecture, which is the complex uh, of the National Pavilion in uh, the gardens uh, of Castello in Venice. The garden of the Biennale is a small, a small museum, a live museum. I would remember on this, uh, sorry to, to be selfish, but uh, the first thing that I did when I was, uh, I became director of the Biennale was to publish a guide to this museum with the history of all the, the, the pavilions uh, which are there. Well, uh, to, to create, uh, to build the pavilion of the new uh, bookshop obviously was a subject of a lot, a lot of discussion. People started to say, you have, we have to do a competition, we have to do an international competition and so on and so on and so on. And uh, afterwards they started to say, okay, we have a competition with uh, 30 invitation and we have more or less uh, 30 members of the jury. This is what they say to me. And I said, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, no way it was, if uh, I would accept the solution, nothing would be built. And I, I called, I, I was, Jim was one, was during his life, during our life, was one of, Jim Sterling was one of my closest friend. And I gave a call to Jim and we went, me, my wife, uh, Jim, and uh, Jim girlfriend, we wanted to take the measures where to put the pavilion. There are all the photos, we, we have a few photos of that. And afterwards, so we built, uh, we, we started to build uh, the pavilion because <clears throat> I had been able to find uh, some money from uh, a man who was very, very intelligent this time that created something that became a gigantic, a gigantic enterprise afterwards, which is Permastidisa, uh, an Australian, uh, originally Australian. And uh, so with the money, <coughs> we, built, we built the pavilion. And the idea of the pavilion is typical of Venice, and it's typical of the, the story is typical of the stupidity of the human beings. The idea of Jim was to put it uh, along the main axis of the Biennale with the, the longest vitrine to exhibit books, the longest vitrine existing in Venice, and very, very long. It's a continuous vitrine, and it's a continuous window. Uh, when everything was finished and the book were, was there, uh, an employee of the Venetian administration arrived with a gigantic boat full of little trees and put all the trees around. So uh, uh, just uh, to, to give you how was, how, which was the perception and I, we couldn't do anything, we couldn't do anything. And uh, so for several years, uh, the, the building remained there with all these trees around where instead it was supposed that people can walk and see the books. And uh, Venice is difficult, but it's difficult. The world is difficult. <laughs> Well, still the, the internal space is uh, the relationship between uh, you and the, the books and the outside is, is still extremely, extremely uh, wonderful. Um, it, it's funny, Luca, there is a story about that. Uh, obviously, 
the building was finished for, for the opening, exactly the one night before the official opening of the Biennale. And uh, uh, the roof uh, had not this color we can see now in uh, the pictures uh, you are projecting, you are presenting in uh, during this conversation. And uh, it was disturbing because it was gray, very gray, uh, not yet, uh, not green as it is. Sure. And, and so and we were there uh, and Jim was, uh, <clears throat> was discussing with the workers. And finally, the decision was all the people working in the Biennale, they were several, several, tens and tens of people working in the different pavilion. They went on the top. You can walk on the top of the pavilion, as you know. And uh, everybody did, did a pee. <laughs> and so it became, uh, became, uh, green. became green. <laughs> this is also architecture. <laughs> Jim was very funny. Yeah, this was, was Jim's funny. idea, of course. Sorry, this was this uh, Jim's idea, of course. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> going from uh, realized pavilions to a series of uh, more contemporary projects um, that are the, I would say, great interiors and. Uh, just to, to, to jump a little bit to the strict contemporaneity, uh, where one would say that there is no space for contemporary architecture in Venice, but actually I'm showing two projects like the Pinot Collection by uh, Tadao Ando or Palazzo dei Tedeschi by uh, Oma, Rem Kolhas, but I could also talk about uh, Renzo Piano's Vedova Foundation uh, renovation and, and others, uh, others projects that are uh, at, at the moment uh, being uh, realized. So, um, on contrary, th th this project uh, represents a kind of evidence of the presence uh, in, in, in Venice of, uh, I would say, a sophisticated uh, reflection on the relationship between heritage and contemporary architecture. Even if these projects are uh, different between them, and also the clients uh, are, are the nature of the clients are, 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 that promote it are, are different. But what connects them is this uh, extremely respectful approach toward the urban uh, image of the city. So the projects are practically invisible from the outside. And they are characterized uh, also on the on on, on the other side on, on different level of radical intervention in the internal spatial uh, configuration. So we we witness in, in some kind of way we all agree that this is an extremely coherent way to to deal with heritage with Venice today. I would also name um, Francesco Magnani and Traudo. Traudi Pelzel intervention and the uh, Tower of Arsenale, which could be contextualized within this uh, uh, this attitude uh, of the recent uh, of the recent years. But um, my question, a little bit not provocative, but just in, in order to discuss a little bit about these things, is looking to the past, now looking to the history of the city, the, the project that we have seen on Monday, things that we have discussed today. In, uh, in is, is it also kind of, um, um, I would say, not enough uh, courageous uh, uh, projects in the sense that they, 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 they just uh, uh, show a kind of moral acceptance of the general public uh, that, that, uh, that, that what, what simply people would at maximum level accept. No? For example, in other, I, 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 in other uh, um, uh, contexts like France, for example, or, or even England, no? maybe these attitudes would be really a, a little bit outdated. No? What could, could Venice accept more hmm? of, or, I, I mean, the contemporary architecture in the city? Well, uh, we have always, uh, the problem of the presence of contemporary architecture in the city is, uh, is uh, my, in my opinion, is that a, a fake, uh, a fake problem, Luca. Because 
Always mm. uh, in Venice, we had the big transformations. And uh, I think that uh, you put some images which can give a very, a very simple uh, uh, idea of that. And the fact that contemporary architecture is part of, uh, of the heritage of Venice is just represented by these two buildings you are showing now. If uh, we assume that also the historical, the historical net of Venice, its historical structure, uh, let's say better, it, its uh, historical face is very, very, it changes, it changes continuously through the centuries. It's also true that inside of, uh, of the building, under the facades of the building, Venice is absolutely contemporary. The Fonda dei Tedeschi by Oma and Cola, as you can see, was a building which was supposed, which was built in 15th century. There were very strange idea about uh, the possibility that uh, Fra Giocondo designed the, the building and so on and so on. Uh, this was the places where Dürer stayed and so on. But this was just from the beginning, a, gigant a gigantic warehouse. Gigantic warehouse where they sold all the, the materials, all what uh, the German uh, countries produced, and it was just the, the connection between the places of production of German merchandises and the Orient. This was the nature of the building. <clears throat> and, but this building had been transformed continuously. When I saw it, this building was just a, a concrete mm. building. Mm. It was the, the quantity of iron inside of this building, which was a material not really used in the 15th century to build buildings, was gigantic, was gigantic. The same thing is, was true, partially true, for the Punta della Dogana. But <clears throat> while the Fondaco dei Tedeschi was the post office of Venice, and uh, in the top of the post office, office for Venice, there, were, there was the area which was used during the war for the communication in all the northern Italy, to give you an idea of which transformation the building had. The Punta della Dogana, which uh, is uh, one of the most uh, symbolic and monumental place in, in the town, as we saw before, looking at the image of the Teatro del Mondo, which is just was anchored, anchored exactly in front of uh, the little tower we concluding in front of San Marco, this uh, triangular building. This building was full of pa abandoned paper of the Italian public administration. It was an archive. This gigantic archive had a very interesting characteristic, which, because the building didn't have floor, didn't have floor, it was invaded by water continuously, like San Marco. And so all the documents were subject, they were covered by water. So a long, a long discussion started and there was a lot, a lot of <clears throat> proposal to transform this, uh, to preserve this building and to use it for cultural institution. And finally, the administration of the town of this, uh, in uh, this time, decided to transform Punta della Dogana in the Museum of Contemporary Art. Venice has an extraordinary quantity of museums. You have the most beautiful museum, uh, which is the Academia, 
you have a modern museum of art, uh, you have a 18th century art museum, which is Carazzonico. We, had an, we have an extraordinary museum of, contem of modern art, which is uh, Guggenheim. But we don't have a museum of the art of our days. And this is strange if you think that Venice is the town of the Biennale where you have the most important uh, exhibition devoted uh, to contemporary art. So the idea was to create <clears throat> a museum of art. And it was a very simple way of resolving the problem. Uh, the town said, the administration of town said, you have uh, cultural institutions, museum, who, who are interested to have uh, this building for a certain number of years uh, as a, uh, a museum, as a, a private museum. The property is of the town and the museum is instead the property for a certain number of years of the institution running it. The, project, the process was this. Who is interested should come with a project of an architect, to restore the entire building and with the list of work of art destined to be uh, exhibited. This was the tender. And this tender, <coughs> it is very funny because obviously Guggenheim was very interested and they presented their project and the project was by, by Zadid. And the Pinot Foundation presented its own project with the pro uh, its own proposal with Tadao, Tadao Andos project. But the funny thing is that the Guggenheim, they have the most beautiful Kandinsky you can find. They have the most beautiful uh, clay you can find and so on. But they are not contemporary. And we wanted to have a museum of contemporary art. And this is what Pinot <coughs> from the Pinot Foundation has. Mm -hmm. And the project of Tadao Ando was a very nice project. It was very complicated to build it, but it was, it was successfully built. Uh, the budget was respected at one euro, one euro, and the timing was perfectly respected. It was just a demonstration that it's possible to do series of things and at the same time to preserve something was destined. Mm. I want to, if I wanted to laugh, uh, about, this was the example, uh, the example I'm giving to you, it's, uh, it's the most important uh, uh, event uh, in which the discussion between building something of new or preserving something or, preser or just preserving, which should be the strategy for Venice. When uh, the Fenice, the theater of the Fenice, which is one of the most uh, important theater in the world, burned out, obviously the decision was, there are two options, to rebuild it as it was, or to do an international competition for something perfectly new. The, the, the topic was for how many years we can give up to the idea to have the furniture working in the town. Mm -hmm. And what was very clear, if you do a comp an international competition and you started to build, the build a new building would take decades, decades. If you say, we'll rebuild it as it was, you can start immediately. And this was the, 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 the decision and I was in the jury of the competition. And uh, one, obviously, building a theater, 
new or old, never mind. To build a uh, theater is uh, to understand how acoustically it works. And uh, the Fenicia had the perfect sound, very nice. Everybody knew that the sound of the Fenicia was uh, fantastic. And there was a great uh, discussion. When we arrived to the, to the end, if uh, the, pro the winner should be the Aldo Rossi project, and uh, there is something, Luca, you should suggest uh, to the people, because there is a very interesting, very important uh, modern contemporary space inside of the Fenicia, completely designed by Aldo Rossi, which is a copy of the Vicenza, which is a very, people don't go very often to see it, but it is very interesting. So at the end, there was a, a project by Aldo Rossi and a project by Guy Ulenti. They were the, the final two. <clears throat> and the, the discussion was about the quality of uh, acoustic in the two, in the two, in the two schemes. And um, obviously we, you have to have a, a measure, a stick yard, which was the acoustic of the theater. And we had a, fun, a very funny, funny discussion because they, we had some measures and uh, I didn't agree with the, the decision uh, which was supported by somebody in the, in the jury. And so we started to discuss on which is the exact measure of, of, the, of the acoustic of the, of the room of the main, main room, main space in the theater. And they had figures, uh, and I had figures too. <clears throat> we had all the same figures. And uh, at a certain point, uh, one of the very, very important uh, acoustic uh, in the jury say, this is the exact figure. And I say, I said, I, I don't agree. I, I, I don't agree with this figure because this figure would support Gaia Lady project. And I didn't want, I wanted Aldo Rossi project. Uh, and uh, we started to discuss and they said, but this is the figure. If this is the figure, Gaia Lady is the winner. And I say, okay, mathematically is in this way. But afterwards, as I am a Venetian, I thought, and I say, and I investigate, and I ask it, when you got this figure, when you did this measure of the quality of the acoustic. And obviously there was a date nearby Near, there was a figure and the date when this measure was done. And, uh, okay, uh, as a Venetian, I know, I knew that in this period, this date, could be that in Venice there was a tide water. Mm -hmm. So it came out that they did the measures. They fixed these figures in a day when uh, under the stage of the Fenicia, there was uh, three meters of water, three meters of water. And so uh, we started to say, okay, if we wanted to put, if we wanted to respect this measure and reproduce this measure exactly, we should put water inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this is funny because the tender, to give you a, a, an idea of how complicated it was, the tender implies that you have to go 16 meters under the level of the water. And you have to, get, to build a gigantic uh, uh, box of concrete. Uh, and, so, and this is what had been done. But this, just to give you an idea of how complicated and uh, also funny could be to, 
to be to work in, in Venice and to take a decision for Venice. Sorry to be so long, but no, no, I absolutely, know. absolutely interesting. Uh, I, it reminded me that I forgot to put the picture of the of Fenice because it it it, 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 it is a topic that to, in today's discussion. Uh, 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 we should absolutely, absolutely, absolutely discuss. So, going uh, uh, toward the really um, the, the the total contemporaneity, a uh, couple of images that describe uh, how how our city uh, is seen by the larger audience, international audience today, through these um, tragedies, which Fenice in some kind of way is also a part of, or was. Uh, it's sinking under the pressure of tourism and uh, the signs of uh, the great uh, infrastructure that are being built and that should save uh, our future. No? So uh, uh, great phenomena, internationally renowned, but that, that uh, in fact uh, describe today's Venice, but also only superficially describes our contemporaneity. I would suggest that maybe the, the biggest problem that we witness today uh, in the city is uh, um, uh, an absence of ideas on how from the political uh, 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 here, here, how to deal with, with the city, which kind of future to, to, in particular, how to deal with the residents, inhabitants, and uh, how to give an, an alternative to this general, today's general, um, attitude of uh, laissez-faire, no? so no particular policy is needed. Venice is so much uh, interesting for the international order that, that the tourism will satisfy its future in some kind of way. So what is your opinion on what is going on, 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 on the residency, on the tourism, and also uh, a reflection if we go to the hyper-contemporaneity, uh, the, the potential of the city in these po post-pandemic times? Well, uh, the only thing uh, which is very clear to me is that there is not a, a vision, uh, there is not an idea now of what to do of Venice, a shared idea of what to do of Venice. And I think that this is a characteristic uh, of the, not only of what is going, uh, what is going through in a town, uh, an historical town like Venice, but is part of our contemporary life. I mean, the, this uh, absence of capacity to, to take a, a decision or to, to see streets in front of us. Uh, from this point of view, I'm, I am absolutely skeptical and pessimistic. I mean, everything is going through as it happens. And the images you can you can see here is representative of that. From one side, uh, on, the, on the right of the screen, I can see the Mose, which was the, an invention to stop the tide water, uh, a gigantic quantity of money. Uh, and so the money was driving everything. The money was driving everything. And uh, the problem when you have such a great quantity of money as the, as the money they put in building this, uh, this dam, mobile dam, uh, is the fact that they were not, uh, they were interested just to spend the money, just to spend the money. And afterwards, there was not con any concern. And in fact, there is not uh, any concern or how this gigantic machine will work, who is going to pay to maintain it, to open this, uh, <clears throat> this dam cost uh, millions uh, each time you do it. And it doesn't resolve uh, the real, real problems of Venice. And, uh, just today opening the newspaper, I saw again that the people in charge of the preservation of San Marco Square uh, and San Marco Church, they are complaining about the fact that uh, with the Mose, you don't keep it dry. Yeah. The church is completely wet. <clears throat> well, there is no, there is no vision. The same thing is is by the present. This fantastic pictures when you 
you you see this boat. Uh, you perceive that there is no scale relationship between uh, this boat and what is the environment around. This is big, a big, a big, big problem. But in the same time, if you take away all the boats from the port of Venice, what do you do about uh, the twenty thousand people working for this boat uh, for this industry? Uh, it's it's complicated. It's very complicated. It's also true that uh, <clears throat> in Venice is happening what is uh, uh, what's happening in many historical city in Italy. Uh, if you go to Florence, <clears throat> in the center of Florence, uh, the number of the inhabitants is smaller than the number of inhabitants in Venice is smaller. Mm. The people living in the center of Florence, mm. the number is smaller of the people living in Venice in this moment. And so uh, it's very, very, very complicated. The problem is that, uh, because everybody has, can find a solution, but mm. the problem is, are the historical town like Venice, like the center of Florence, destined to work in the same way in which our museums work. In other words, you go to the museum, you stay there two hours, three hours, five hours, maybe from 10 in the morning to the moment when they close. You stay in the, in the museum temporarily just for a period, for a moment of your life. Is it the same with the historical center? They will live only temporarily. There are gigantic museums where people arrive. <clears throat> they arrive with their airplane and the day afterwards they go away with the plane and so on and so on. This is something that we should I think we should start to uh, to think about is our relationship with the built environment shaped by temporaneity? Are we here just for short periods without any roots and so on and so on? This are, I think could be questions from which, uh, from which we should start. Obviously, there are <clears throat> an enormous number of, of decisions which could be, could be taken. Also, if uh, in a situation like the historical city in Italy, you are always conflicting, entering in fight with the small or large interest that they have only one target to, to preserve themselves. Um, Scott, I have uh, a last question. Uh, I was just asking you if I can pose it or we go to the questions and answers. The, no, please continue by all means. Okay, okay. I have uh, the, the last question uh, that uh, uh, it's a kind of, it's a kind of exercise, no? It's a kind of tricky question that I would like to do with this comparison of two bridges that reveal uh, two moments uh, of the modernization of Venice, an infrastructural modernization of Venice. On the left, you can see the bridge built by Eugenio Miozzi, a great engineer from the 1930s, with a span of a uh, little more than 40 meters. And on the other side, you have the recently uh, built uh, uh, Constitution Bridge by Santiago Calacrava that has a span of a little bit of like, like 80 meters that are uh, very close one to it. The first one was built in a traditional way with a stone structure. We are in 1930s. The second one is has been built in iron structure. No? The first one, uh, Miozzi's, was designed with this uh, uh, almost, let's say, neoclassical language. Uh, the other one with this really gentle and uh, highly elegant uh, shape. 
But uh, the first one, so Miozzi, was uh, realized in really a small am amount of years and offered, uh, after almost 90 years of its existence, a great response through time no, to the static behavior of uh, uh, the structure and the relationship with the soil of Venice. The other one, so uh, Calatrava's one, from that point of view was, uh, and still is a little bit problematic. No? Since the beginning, it was uh, blamed of uh, missing no? this understanding of the behavior of the Venetian soul. So, in, in two uh, uh, different uh, responses that engineers uh, or, or architecture gave to uh, two moments of uh, modernization. What kind of reaction this comparison uh, suggests you, to you? Well, look, there are very, very to discuss of these uh, two bridges uh, uh, implies many, many different problems. I try to 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 speak only a few of them. But in order to understand what we are talking about, the, the first bridge, the Miozzi Bridge, uh, which was built during the 30s of the past century, which is a beautiful building, which is a beautiful bridge in any case. And uh, also from a, um, a calculation point of view of the calculation that Miozzi did, it's really outstanding. This bridge connect the ancient part of the city and the railway station, which is a, a completely new modern function, which uh, took shape uh, finally, the railway station after the war. So the, the building, the bridge, the Miozzi bridge, was created to connect the railway station with the city. The railway station, you can see a part of the of the system of building which is which is connected to the railway station on the pictures you can see on the on the right with the Calatrava bridge. The Calatrava bridge arrives directly in the area of the station. And it is connecting the area of the station with the area of the arrivals of buses, cars, and so on. In other terms, <clears throat> there was just one with one bridge was possible in Venice to create the connection which is the dream of any city in the world. The direct connection between the terminal of the transportation on iron and the terminal of transportation on rubber. Car and train together arriving in the same point. The connection, <clears throat> the decision to build the uh, Calatrava bridge was just to exploit this unexploited possibility to connect two terminals for two different kinds of traffic, number one. Number two, there was the clear perception that the transformation of the area around the rubber terminal, let's say the terminal of car and rubber buses and so on, and the arrival of tourist buses would create a great movement of people <clears throat> between the railway station and this new area. This is the reason of, of the Calatrava, of the Calatrava bridge. The decision to give the job to Calatrava was a decision which was arrived from uh, the administration of the town in this time. And the idea was, uh, knowing very well Calatrava's work and uh, the solution that he designed immediately uh, when he got the, uh, the job was to, to go very fast <clears throat> because otherwise you have to close for a longer period, for a long period, the canal, which was something which was not possible. It was needed to build it fast. Afterwards, uh, it became very, very complicated. Very, very complicated just for the administration 
for administration reasons, not for political or something like that, but for administration reasons. And this is the point. This is really the point. Miozzi, the engineer who did this brilliant preach there, was an employee, mm. employee of the administration. He was a man who in two years was able to design the building, to build the building, to run all the administration programs. In other terms, during the 30s, but also later during the 50s and the 60s, <clears throat> the public administration had, was, had fantastic, fantastic people working, technical people, design, engineer. <clears throat> this was destroyed after the 60s mm -hmm. of the past time. Now there is nobody able to not even to, to conceive a bridge like this, but not even able to read a drawing by Calatrava in the administration of the town. The state, and this is not true only for Italy, du during the second half of the past century, destroyed all its technical capacity. The, Idea, idea, ideology, which is instead the byproduct of very serious economic interest, is to have state, the government, unable to take technical decisions. Because a state which is unable to take technical decisions is a state that you can exploit financially. Mm -hmm. This is what we are living through. We are living through this. In Italy, this is <clears throat> extremely evident. It's part of our political problem. The state, the community doesn't have technical, technical capacity. And so all the disasters, I mean, if uh, Venice from this point of view, it's, uh, it's perfect. I mean, uh, the most important public work done in, in the country is the Mose, mm -hmm. the dance. It was a disaster. Mm -hmm. From any point of view, a disaster, technically, financially, politically, Mm -hmm. And so on and so on. Not by chance. It's not. <clears throat> I don't think that anybody of the people who was involved, involved in the building of the Mosa, they went all in jail. Yeah. They went all in jail. Mm -hmm. But they were not the technicians, I mean. They were not the technician. The Calatrava Bridge is it's the byproduct of one of the most uh, stupid way of uh, uh, of uh, running the process incapacity incapacity of the public administration to to take a technical technical solutions and, there and is I a would... funny story luca you should tell that you know in venice eh, uh, it's not very easy for the people which are which are obliged to move, uh, for instance, on chariots or or way which are limited in their movement to move because there are many many bridges, and it is impossible to transform all the bridges in order to give the opportunity to everybody to move without restriction and limitation. It's impossible. But if there is a case where you can move perfectly, <clears throat> was the connection between the railway station and Piazzale Roma, which is the place where the buses arrive. Why? Because this is a physical law. The Vaporetto 
is always at the same level of uh, the platform where you arrive. And so if, if you are on a wheelchair, you enter in the vaporator. And the vaporator brings you to the other place. And there is not, not problem of staircase, nothing. Two, two bodies in the water, they stay always at the same level. <laughs> but they spent a fortune to build, not a design it by Calatrava, a kind of... Uh, elevator. Ele an, an egg. Yeah, an egg, yes. An egg, an egg moving all along the spine of the bridge. The funny thing is that the, this elevator, this, uh, this egg was a egg in plastic, let's say, but there was not conditioning. And so the first effect is that you can die in summertime inside <laughs> of an egg, <clears throat> an egg of plastic. And number two, there is security. And one of the security was represented by the fact that the egg can have only a certain level of vibration. But an egg moving on a bridge in iron, which for nature and structural reason should have the vibration, was always stopping. The reality was this, that the egg was moving. It stopped and you died because you remained there for a few hours exposed to, to the sun. This is the technical culture of the people is practically the culture of an animal. With a vaporetto that goes every 10 minutes from one point to the other, so. To the other, exactly. <clears throat> exactly. It still exists. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, Scott, I'm really sorry that we finished uh, <laughs> with the sad story, uh, but uh, it, it's uh, it, actually we, we we had to talk about these problems in order to contextualize the difficulties of uh, working, living in Venice today, and dealing with the administration and in 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 and, and, and all the difficulties of contemporary. So, I, I first of all, I would like to to thank Francesco for for his uh, for his marvelous answers, and I give. Uh, the stage to you.